Our Sorry. next panel session is Jumpstarting Growth in Commercial Solar. My name is Corey Honeyman. I'm one of the other analysts at GTM Research covering downstream demand in the US. And so for this panel covering the commercial market in the US, when you think about it, all in all, it's been a pretty volatile period for the commercial market over the past year or so. And you know, while we like to couch residential and commercial into this collectively booming distributed PV market, you know, there, are, there are a lot of reasons to be bullish about residential solar, but there are a lot of you know, difficult questions. There's a lot of noise that's still in play that's hindering growth in the commercial market. So we have five great panelists lined up here to answer some of the key questions that will shape the commercial market over the next several years. I'll let them briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll jump right into it. Hi, everyone. My name is Kerry Hayes. I am the Director of Business Development for RAC Solar. Um, I've been in the solar industry for eight years now, riding the solar coaster. Um, as many of you probably know and have heard, uh, RAC, the residential assets of RAC Solar were recently sold to Sunrun or merged with Sunrun um, about two months ago. RAC Solar remains a commercially focused company um, based in California, and we're excited about uh, the new opportunities ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Song Yi. I'm a CFO of Standard Solar. Uh, Standard Solar is a developer in EPC, you know, residential and commercial business. Uh, been existing since 2004. Hello, everyone. My name is David Vincent. I'm with Conergy. Conergy is a 15-year-old company, international company. Uh, last year was acquired by uh, Kawa Capital Management out of Florida. Um, we basically do the whole gamut in photovoltaics with uh, EPC, financing, distribution, um, and just about every point in between. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Woody Rubin. I'm the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Main Street Power. Uh, yeah, ba we're based in Boulder, Colorado, and we are a developer, uh, owner, operator, financer of uh, solar projects. Uh, primarily to date, it's been in the distributed, uh, the DG small scale utility and residential space. Hi everyone, I'm Brendan Quinlevin. I'm our Director of Solar Sales and Development for Constellation. Uh, Constellation is now part of the Exelon family as of a couple years ago, and uh, our solar group really um, exists to support the larger growth of the Constellation retail energy offerings. And so we own and operate approximately 175 megawatts of distributed generation and small utility scale solar in the US. Great, all right, thanks. So, Carrie, we're going to start off a question with you. Since, you know, REC, you have the, the benefit of having exposure to what worked and what hasn't worked in the residential market. You know, I'm curious, what lessons can you take from a lot of the more, you know, aggressive growth we've seen in the residential market um, and think about what is the primary challenge right now that's hindering growth in the commercial market? <clears throat> sure. So, um... Uh, back when Chris Macy's and I were, were hanging out at REC in around 2008, we were talking about residential finance as a key driver for the next growth in residential. Um, we certainly believe that um, the, the, the company or the group of companies or the partnerships that developed to sort of crack the code around small commercial finance is one of the keys to opening up the addressable market in uh, the commercial market today. We certainly saw the growth really take off once that was established on residential. There's certainly different markets, but that's um, something that we're spending a lot of time and energy thinking about right now. I think the collective group in the room here from the financiers, the developers, and the EPCs and others are sort of zeroing in on the target and getting closer and closer to um, finding a way to help quantify that risk, um, mitigate off-taker risk, um, find the customers, and uh, make it happen. And that's something I think um, will be a huge driver going forward um, to open up a, a large part of the market that I believe everyone is quite interested in right now. Right. So that's a good segue into um, sort of the background that Woody, you have, right? So, you know, with Main Street Power, your sweet spot within the sort of spectrum of services of a developer, you're focusing more on the financing realm. And, you know, how does you know, the challenge of financing small-scale rooftop solar jive with you as sort of the spectrum of challenges that are hindering growth in the catch-all commercial space? Sure. So I would say that <clears throat> the major challenge is the uh, variety of um, 
the variety of inputs, if you will, in a, in a, in a model and a financing structure that you have in the small scale commercial space uh, as compared to, you know, on one end of the spectrum, uh, residential solar and on the other utility scale. And I think, you know, solar is at an interesting place right now and as, as a market in that you've, you've got a project finance model that um, is tried and true and works well for um, utility scale deals. But that, you know, that project, that project finance model has come out of years of development um, and it came out of the you know, deregulation, of, you know, at least in our country, in electricity markets, uh, the deregulation of the, of the market. And so for a you know, $500 million wind loan for a um, you know, co-gen facility, uh, that model works great. For a uh, 500 kW system, that model sucks. So um, now, now in a residential, you know, in a residential model, it can it can work well um, because it's you know it's based off of you have basically a single you know kind of credit matrix that I think the the market is coalescing around in FICO scores, and you have a a nice way to aggregate a cross collateralized portfolio of you know thousands of homes. Um, in the in the small scale, see, you know, commercial space, there are just simply a lot more variables. And so from a transaction efficiency point of view, uh, it doesn't, you know, the, this end of the spectrum on for, you know, in terms of project financing, uh, structuring like a big, you know, a, a big $500 million deal doesn't work. Um, and we're not there yet to, uh, I don't think, to structure the, you know, financing parameters uh, akin to a resi fund. And so I think, you know, that's the, the, the variety of inputs that you need to create that financing box are, are still being determined. Right, yeah, that, I mean, that's a key takeaway, right? So a lot of the higher transactional costs that are associated with aggregating a portfolio of, you know, mostly perhaps non-investment grade off-takers in that small CNI space really poses a big challenge. So, you know, in the near term, you know, we're seeing the beginning of um, you know, potential solutions through, you know, the True Solar Initiative and then other companies that are beginning to pop up, whether it's, you know, through Mercatus, which I know you guys are involved with, um, or potentially Wiser Capital, Capital or other companies like that. But, you know, in the near term, what can a developer, you know, like Standard Solar do in terms of structuring customer, you know, off-taker agreements to mitigate some of that risk when you don't really have the sort of FICO score equivalent? <laughs> I think the best thing is find niche market that has good credit rating. I mean, uh, commercial is great, but looking 20 year and having good credit rating is going to be hard to find. But if you go to universities or municipal government, well, those two entities will always exist. You could see if they issue bond, you could use that credit rating. All the financiers will take that rating. So finding those kind of niche market and exploiting it uh, especially for municipal government and counties. It is amazing as long as you get through one county and they're so competitive that as soon as one county signs up for solar, the next guy will, you don't even have to solicit. They'll call you because they know you did the solar project and they'll say, can you do the same thing for us but I need it slightly bigger than the next guy. So they want to be better and bigger than the next person and we have been very successful in the Eastern Shore or we have had from one project six follow-ons, each one slightly bigger than the next one. So it's uh, finding those little niches will help you grow uh, right. your market share. But so the question is, are those niches a sort of depleting low-hanging fruit though, right? And so if you have this larger space where, you know, perhaps I, you know, what I've read recently is that around 90% of that smaller CNI rooftop space still is m relatively untapped. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, is there any strategy in play right now to actually tap into that? Or is it, you know, at this point, more of a beneficial approach to still just find the, a more geographically distributed, you know, set of low-hanging fruits with these municipal projects? No, for those projects, you just have to look for a different type of financing. What we're discovering right now is there's a new financing offering by small financing shop that is backed by high net worth individuals who wants to shelter their tax, taxable income. So those entities are not like a bank where they're looking for a specific credit rating and you have to pass all these hurdles because bank is so regulated. Those entities, if you can find those financiers and they are blooming left and right, 
And they're very small, so they're not looking for two, three megawatt deals. They're looking for a megawatt or less, and they want to diversify that risk across the board. So it's, it's a good market to have, and um, you know, finding those uh, financiers will get you uh, going on those type of projects. Right, but so how comparable are those kinds of funds relative to what we see in the residential space? Are these you know, upwards of 100 million, or are these less? Uh, these funds each has about 20 to 30 million per year is what they want to deploy. So it's a relatively small firm, but small amount, but there is a lot of them and more are coming, so. Right, okay. So, you know, financing challenges, that's clearly, you know, one of the big barriers to potentially achieving scale. But, you know, outside of financing, one of the bigger considerations to come into play in the commercial market is thinking about strategic partnerships. And so, you know, in the commercial market, the two vanilla strategies are either leveraging your in-house EEP and or C capabilities um, or, you know, consistently looking outside of your company to take advantage of projects that are shovel ready and have a lot of those PPAs in place. So, you know, Brendan, from, from your perspective, which is, you know, a better strategy to potentially achieving scale in the commercial market? Sure. I mean, I think it depends on the lens that you're looking through as well. If I put the, the constellation hat on, um, you know, we're a retail energy provider. And so any services that fall within that network, you know, we're interested in playing a part of. Um, that being said, our solar approach is very um, staffed according to where we play. So, you know, in California, we're going to go and solidify partners that have legged into that local community, the local municipalities and schools, um, the local, you know, commercial industrial folks that, you know, they have that local relationship, but what they don't have is the tax equity, the construction financing, and the takeout financing that an entity like a Constellation or a, a Duke or an NRG, you know, they all have. It's just what scale are we all willing to play? And I think coming back to the, the you know, the challenges that commercial faces is a one-off 100 kW um, small warehouse operation in Ontario is gonna really struggle. But if a local developer spends a year aggregating 20 of those and it's a two megawatt portfolio, and they work with a entity who can provide them with a format to go offer the customer, i.e. a form of PPA, then that starts to feel like it's a repeatable path. Those projects start getting financed and then there's some precedent set to build from. Right, so but how, how unique is you know, Constellation, right? Because you have the stronger balance sheet to offer that kind of financing solution. Sure. And so, is that really a replicable strategy of being able to leverage your in-house capital for partnering with local EPC firms for, you know, the rest of the market? Well, I think, you know, the rest of the market can play with the Constellations of the world. <laughs> everyone has their, everyone has their piece <laughs> in this pie. Um, and, you know, when I look at seven, eight years ago, in my prior life in national accounts. And that's really when we saw the uptake of commercial rooftops. You saw Walmart doing 60 stores at a time, Kohl's doing 80 stores at a time, Staples. It was new, it was innovative, and they hadn't been offered it otherwise. The problem is the story's getting a little stale. So the 20-year PPA, everyone in the commercial space has heard. They've either moved or they have not. So now we need to come back as a group and say, okay, you bring something like a financial platform from a constellation, um, something like a, you know, EPC platform from, you know, possibly, you know, like a Conergy or an REC, and then you bring that local regional developer who has spent the time and the effort, you know, to solidify that customer relationship, that's where I think it is repeatable. Okay. And so how does this all jive with Conergy, right? So I know you guys recently announced this fund that's targeting a lot more mid-scale projects, you know, perhaps in the five to even upwards of 20 megawatt range, where it gets to be a blurry distinction between utility scale and commercial at that point. But you know, I'm curious, you know, a lot of the challenges that we see and we've been talking about on the small CNI space, is that you know, something that's still an issue for financing one-off large ground mount projects? Yeah, so with the small, commercial space, it's really not that they can't be financed. It's just that they can't be financed for a rate that's going to make sense for the host customer, right? Because of the transactional costs and everything that's on top of it. So we're looking at strategies where we're trying to um, really line up all the documents that go into it, making them all identical, right? With the difference of 
site addresses, customer names, and signatures on the bottom. The trouble with that is when you go into that small commercial host customer, uh, most of them aren't willing to just take your documents and sign them, right? I mean, you see that a lot more in the residential arena where it's like, it's a take it or leave it deal. Here's the documents, here's how it works. You know, if you want it, sign it. If not, I'm going to your neighbor's house, right? In the commercial space, you just don't have that clientele yet that's there that's just willing to sign standardized documents. So that's kind of one of the hurdles that, that we're looking at. Um, you know, of course, there's the low-hanging fruit pieces that are out there, right, the, the check boxes. But I think in general in the market, one of the troubles with getting projects financed is there are so many boxes that have to be checked. So, you know, we feel that, that really the push needs to be for um, more loose terms in the financing, uh, finding investors that are willing to take a little bit more risk, whether it's on credit, whether it's on capacity, to try to make it work. So we're really pushing a blended strategy uh, where we're kind of looking at all these different pieces and trying to remain as flexible as possible. Right. So in terms of flexibility, you know, Woody, you know, we talked a while back, too, about how you can be sort of creative in offering, um, you know, st structuring those financing solutions and off-taker agreements like I was talking to Song about before. Uh, you know, what do you think, is there a potential one-size-fits-all to structuring off-taker agreements to potentially deal with a lot of these hurdles? I mean, sure. I, I think, uh, you know, Having a, you know Solar City having a single PPA in one state, you know our some of our you know Resi partners and our Resi funds will have a have a single PPA for every homeowner in the state. Uh, you know, um, I, you know Sun and others have been and others who have done the big big box you know retail. Uh, those were you know those were single off take agreements in that they were uh, you know an individual PPA for uh, every you know Kohl's or you know Walmart across a, a, a big area so sure that helps and that's a significant component of it um, of I think making the economies of scale in the small you know in a small CNI space make sense um, uh, however I think that you know that's just kind of low-hanging fruit I think that's the kind of the first in my opinion that's kind of the first rung on the ladder is that yeah you got to have paper that looks the same um, the, the tr you know the trickier uh, rungs on the ladder as you get higher up are um, filling in you know the standardization on all the other buckets um, and getting creative around structuring something that uh, will will get to scale um, and be you know financeable on a portfolio basis because right. obviously that's the only ro that way that's uh, you know my opinion that's going to work when you're talking about aggregating you know 50 kW systems. Right. Uh, so uh, so what's an example of a type of structure? in the off-taker agreement that could actually work that hasn't really been employed yet within the commercial space? I'd say um, prepaid structures and hybrid PPA stru and, and hybrid prepaid structures are a possibility. You know, something you see all the way up to the, uh, something that we've looked at in low income, uh, low income or sub-investment, or I should say bad, poor credit offtake in the resi space. And you know, all the way up to there are prepaid structures in the, you know, in the utility space. Um, there are, there. I think there are, you know, interesting ways of, um, as you get up to scale in the CNI space, to you know, to blend, uh, to blend credits and come up with a cross collateralized, you know, portfolio that could be uh, financed in part based on the aggregate credit of the portfolio and in part on the fundamental uh, economics that are similar to Resi in that you know if you've got a PPA at, uh, if you got a PPA at twelve cents and you're you know. In, uh, in a PG&E territory of, you know, say, you know, uh, uh, commercial rates in the 30 cents, that's a compelling argument, I think, to be made to a, uh, you know, credit committee. Okay. All right. Well, I want to take a second to shift back to the partnerships, because I know we've been sort of harping on, you know, the financing bottlenecks, and that's clearly a major challenge that's hindering growth. But, Carrie, you know, with, with REC Solar now that you're all in on commercial solar, you know, we were talking before about the trade-offs between, you know, leveraging the in-house EPC capabilities versus looking outside for that. And with this sort of new full investment into commercial solar, is that also being paired up with becoming a more vertically integrated approach to locking in customers and tapping into, you know, individual customer RFPs as opposed to shovel-ready EPC projects? Absolutely. So that's one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time on the last couple of years. Um, 
in the business development realm is channel partnerships. Um, it's a key strategy, and we all come to conferences like this to meet people and make connections and develop those partnerships. Um, under sort of the headline that all deals are local, you know, we've, we've gone out and sourced opportunities from small to mid-sized EPCs, from distribution customers and others who we can partner with, um, we can provide basically a, a prime EPC relationship with, where we, we provide a commercial backstop, insurance, bonding capabilities, et cetera, and start, start filtering up smaller opportunities up the food chain to us that we can either finance, build, bring traditional finance, um, cash customers, all of the above. Um, so it's a, certainly an important aspect, and I think um, a lot of us in the room have sort of you know, realized that as the, the deal sizes are getting smaller and the, the larger utility projects are fewer and far between. Everyone continues to reach a little further downstream into the CNI market. Um, and again, I think um, the, the financing there is key, but we often find you know, there's plenty of cash customers in the two, three, 400 KW range, um, especially as um, prices have come down significantly over the last several years. Um, I think when the ITC uh, comes down from 30 to 10 or whatever happens there, all of a sudden tax equity is not as important and you know, maybe the game changes again uh, in terms of financing. Um, so there's several angles there, but you know, we're excited about um, really pursuing that channel, channel strategy and something we'll continue to do. Right, so it sounds like it wouldn't be leveraging an in-house EPC capability, it's more of this dealer network approach to actually achieving scale. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the relative experience of the market, you know, continues to get better. And on the construction side of this business, it's certainly um, arguably not that difficult to do what we do. Mm -hmm. So um, our model is sort of to provide the E and the P and let uh, a local contractor do the C and some variation thereof. Right. And David, I, I see you sort of questioning that model. Is that something that jives with your outlook looking forward to? Or? <laughs> it, it partially does, right? Again, we think that you really have to have more of a blended strategy. So while we see that the, you know, the partnership side is definitely important, you know, we're really looking, we're looking at the, you know, the acquisition side, trying to find a deal that is out there, that's developed, it's ready to go, it's, it's uh, looking for someone to pick it up. The problem with those, obviously, is there's so much margin stacking and so many hands in the mix that it's very challenging to make those work economically at the numbers they're at. The second is the, you know, partnering directly with either our dealers, our channel partners, that side, and co-developing projects. What's great about that, if you find the local guys, is it brings the relationship into the host customer, right? So, so you know, you can go out there to a host customer and work with them for a couple years, right? You can go play golf with them every month, do whatever you can to try to make that relationship, but it's not gonna beat the relationship of the kid that they grew up with when they were five years old and now he's a local electrician, right? So if you can find the right kind of connections and people that have been, been into these, uh, these areas for long periods of time and grow that channel partnership, we think that's another great strategy. And then the third one, of course, is the direct, you know, the direct sale, the direct development approach. Right, because when you get into that market and now you're talking about you know, owning the entire vertical, right, from the financing, from the EPC, from the long-term O&M, you know, supplying everything, it's just you. So even though those deals, there's less of those that you'll win, the margin dollars you make on those are significantly more than the, uh, the former. Right. And so the, the concern behind being able to sort of double down on that last approach, is that you know, really rooted in just all of the costs associated with customer acquisition? And how does it, you know, what, I, it, alongside that, is it a longer sales cycle that just doesn't really allow to fit in your year-long planning? Is that the biggest, are those sort of the two big challenges? Yeah, that's, that e that's exactly the hurdle. It's definitely a much longer period. And we keep our doors open too for you know, the direct, uh, direct pay type projects where the customer's just buying it outright. Mm -hmm. And you see a significant amount of those out there if you're in the markets where you know, solar makes sense. California, for example, they're really doing some things out there that, that is making that market great for the direct purchase. But then also, you know, also keeping there on the finance side, the, the PPA market and uh, the other side, but definitely much longer sales cycles in those. And it only works to keep people in the, the markets that are, uh, 
that are really active. Right. And so, you know, going off of this theme of road, the roadmap, or the one sort of the right roadmap to achieving scale with, you know, Main Street Power, you're, you know, solely focused on that sort of financing sweet spot service. And so, is there truly, you know, I mean, I know that you guys offer some of the more advisory roles for some of the EPC side of things, but is there a place for, you know, achieving scale by only offering the financing solution arm? Um, or, you know, how, how unique is your business model in the whole competitive landscape? So, um, I, yeah, I mean, just for clarification, so we, you know, we develop, we develop projects, uh, we own and operate, um, and we also bring kind of the full, you know, kind of capital stack through our, through our partnership to, for a project. So I, I, I would, I'd say we're, we're definitely much more than just the, the financing wing, um, I guess, first of all. But, but, but second of all, I mean, we are, we're a, you know, in our particular case, we're a 30 person, uh, you know, approximately company and the partnership's a little bigger than that. But, um, you know, we're, we're actually starting construction today on a, on a five megawatt project in, in St. Thomas and, you know, there'll be 30 people on site. So, uh, you know, I've, I've, and obviously you don't want me with a shovel on, on the ground, right? So, um, so uh, you know, of course we're, we're partnering, we're out there partnering and what's been, you know, most successful for us is to partner with the guys in the market who, and I think the, the panel's hit it on the head, who have the boots on the ground in the local market that we want to participate in and have all the, you know, local local knowledge and expertise. We've, that's how we, you know, did 20 megawatts in, in Arizona is we, um, we, we partnered with the right, with the right partners in the right market. So I think there, I think there is room for that, but you're absolutely right that in, I think, I think the current environment is um, as the economics on these deals contract, with yield codes out there, the, the you know the continually you know kind of downward pressure on cost of capital, um, there are just solar has a lot of mouths to feed in general on the deals you know in our industry and um, and so yet there are there are continuing pressures on uh, I think finding deals where there are too many mouths to feed if there's an early stage developer, um, a early stage you know got an EPC that might be. Uh, partnering with that, um, and then you've got maybe someone who's providing construction financing, then going to a nut, you know, a kind of a takeout partner. You know, you're up to four or five participants in a deal uh, on a big juicy deal. That might make sense on where, where the, you know, on where where margins are thin. That's that's tough. Right, and so if you're dealing with lots of different local EPC firms, you're ultimately dealing with each of those companies commanding their own margins and you have to deal with that. And I know, you know, Brendan, ultimately, you're doing a lot of work with more just a smaller subset of EPC firms that have visibility into a more regionalized, um, you know, scope. And so, you know, what are some of the trade-offs between having just a select number of EPC brands that you trust, um, you know, in lieu of doing just tons of localized EPCs? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's a matter of focus, right? I mean, so when we all look at this market, we all want to say we're going to do every deal. That's the benefit of, of centralizing with, you know, five to six key EPCs. The negative is we miss out on being opportunistic, um, you know, working with the new market entry that um, is going to build a great project and is looking for a solid PPA. And so our focus probably limits us a bit. So um, what we've had to weigh is what, what is that worth? And for us, when you know, we talk about scaling, we look at these markets and we say, well, we need to get to a certain amount of scale so that in the post-ITC, post-30% post ITC world, we start looking, well, you know, what is the long-term play? And the long-term play is to take your 50 to 100 megawatts in the West Coast and you know, aggregate them into a vehicle that makes sense for those assets, as well as aggregating new assets along the way. Um, and the working with five to six partners has helped us achieve that scale. And so outside of just aggregating these portfolios at a higher scale, what are some of the other strategies that you're beginning to think about in order to prepare for this you know, expected expiration of the federal ITC in 2017? Um, Non-solar products. No, <laughs> no, no, we're looking at solar, but in all honesty, we're looking at solar plus other products. And so as, a, as an energy platform, we're saying, okay, ITC drop-off is coming. We see that the tax piece for us as a tax equity investor is a big piece, to Kerry's point. I mean, when that drops to 10%, we become a bit less relevant. We've been exceptionally relevant over the last five to six years. So we have to look at it and say, well, how do we diversify? How do we spread that risk? 
solar is still going to be economical on its own merits in certain regions. So whether that's RECs start gaining value in California or SRECs uh, and the demand for them in the East Coast starts to ratchet back up as their RPSs start ratcheting back up. As someone mentioned in the last panel, we've been down this road as an industry and we've seen, at least myself over the last eight years, you know, we've seen points where we thought this was going to be the end of the road and it wasn't. And so we went from, you know, all the commercial to the utility and now the utility back to the DG. We're going to ride it, but I think we have to all look at this industry evolving into accepting some more products like battery storage and fuel cells that can be wrapped into all the work we've all done to um, aggregate and commercialize PPAs. Okay, well, I definitely want to talk about the sort of feasibility of you know, pairing storage with solar. But you know, before doing that, um, I mean, having this sort of rosy outlook on this drop off from the federal ITC, it's, I mean, it sounds nice in theory, but inevitably, you know, this loss of this 20% drop off in tax equity demand is a huge hurdle for the commercial market to deal with. And we see even just with uh, the drop off in state level incentives, the commercial market has proven relatively much more sensitive to you know, the drop off in those incentive levels than what we see in the residential market. Right. So what are some you know, particular either financial innovations or you know, strategies that can actually uh, supplement the loss of that tax equity mm -hmm. demand? And that's assuming you're staying solar, not going non-solar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're staying <laughs> solar, um, obviously what's been done in the securitization world, the yield co-concepts, driving down the cost of capital, I think we all know that that's going, that is helping to lead to the future. But let's be honest, not everyone has access to participating in those funds. So I think we look at the utility markets. Let's look at California. California has extreme volatility. Over the last two years, inclusive of this year, almost 20% increase in rates in the SCE territory. So when we look at volatility, and that exists in other markets, you know, the Caribbean um, and Hawaii and, you know, some areas of Connecticut and Massachusetts, solar as costs keep coming down, um, as SRECs and potentially RECs and the value of those, which in the most case in California are pretty much valueless right now, um, we're going, I, I feel firmly that we're going to see value pick up in other ways, maybe in some of those categories. And at the same time, the volatility of the markets is going to help our price to compare, actually compete with that power. But it's going to still be very market specific. And so we all need to be set up in a way that we can respond. OK. Um, and so one other question before we go to Q&A. Um, sort of talking about the sort of geographic distribution of markets, and that is clearly going to have an important role depending on whether it's installation levels or what the avoided cost in all in ultimately is. But you know, in the near term over the next couple of years, you know, Carrie, as you guys still begin to sort of further explore the commercial market, what are a couple of the states that are beginning to ramp up that have you guys most excited? And what about them is sort of different from perhaps the volatility we've seen in states like Arizona and California and New Jersey that have actually dropped off year over year what we saw in 2013? Yeah, so I'll pick one, and not to say that that state's not going to have a ton of volatility and some problems down the road, but that's Minnesota. Um, that's a state we've, uh, we've been to several times. We've been talking to some, some local installers and presented at a couple of Mincia meetings, and I know many of, many of us have been sort of lurking around that market for a couple of years now. Um, that's an interesting market. It's a, it's a small market. It reminds me of Colorado in 2006. Um, it's a bunch of small installers who are pretty excited about an upcoming program. I think there's going to be, you know, sort of the headlines in Minnesota right now are community solar, which I think is an interesting development strategy. Um, I think there are some larger things in play there that um, I know some market players are looking to take advantage of. Um, you know, the value of solar tariff is a, is a key there, and that has some potential long-term problematic complications. Um, but I think in the very near term and an opportuni opportunistic uh, way, that's an interesting market for us. Right. So, you know, how does it make sense to enter a market like Minnesota um, when there's, you know, so many other challenges at play with trying to get local EPC firms and getting all of these financing wrapped up? You know, is sort of figuring out the local dynamics of this new market um, even worth it as opposed to doubling down in the markets you already have familiarity with, though? It's a good question. It's a, it's a focus question, right? And so, you know, we we look to markets that we have good penetration in, and we, we have our, our, our people, we have our strategies there, and our sales targets, et cetera, but we, 
when we talk about new markets, we, we do want to be opportunistic, especially in that small commercial zone, which that market's going to be. And that market's going to drive, I think, some, sign some surprising volume um, later this year and into, into 2015. So um, we want to be oppor opportunistic and take advantage of it. OK. All right. Well, at this point, I want to see if anyone has any questions um, and take out some time to answer any um, you know, topics that you guys would like to cover still. I have a question about the, uh, the storage component that was mentioned a couple of times. What do you see in terms of additional technical risk with the inclusion of, of storage in these types of contracts? I mean, for, for us, so uh, to be fair, not the technical guy on, on storage, but um, <laughs> I, I'm dangerous in that regard. But I mean, what we see the benefit of storage being is that it complements the variability of solar well. Um, from an interconnect standpoint, you're going to leverage most of the same interconnect work that you've done. Um, from an incentive standpoint, you know, really, obviously, markets like New Jersey, Connecticut, California that have incentives are going to help make it more so commercially viable. Um, from a new technology standpoint, I think that's going to be a tough one for financing. Um, but certain investors will have an appetite and a need for that. And I think the markets in which they can repeat that they'd be looking to do. But it's going to be a, um, a slower ramp up. But you know, to me, it feels a bit like the solar market felt in 05, 06. And just to clarify that too, which you know, particular state markets actually represent a feasible opportunity for entering solar with storage right now? Yeah, right now, we're seeing viable opportunities in California, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, and to some extent, uh, New York. Although I would say, you know, anytime you're, you know, dependent on a grant program that isn't readily available, that comes back to the focus question, too. How much do you want to invest uh, in that program? So uh, I, I think it's pretty opportunistic, but those are the states that we're seeing opportunities and actually developers in the market spending time aggregating deal flow. Right. And so what, what are you thinking about outside of an incentive-driven reason for entering those particular markets? What are some of the other factors that come into play that make the case for going solar with storage? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the big one is um, the variability. The other is in a PJM. You know, there's frequency regulation problems and there's frequency regulation value. So it's how do you carve up the value? If we're going to own the battery asset, that frequency regulation um, value is probably going to lie with the investor. If an owner is going to own a PV system and invest in batteries, then they're going to, one, stabilize their energy profile, and two, um, receive additional revenue streams. Okay. Any other can I add something oh, there, yeah, too? Sure, sure. But what we see, really, with that host market, too, for the storage side, is it becomes less of a play on the energy and more of a play on the demand charges. Mm -hmm, right. So you see a lot of these markets, right, where the utilities just keep up in the demand charges. Well, storage is the great way to be able to bring that in there, level up that load, and, and you know, get a good amount of savings from the host perspective just on the, on the demand shaving. Right. And so, how, I mean, along those lines, how valuable of a strategy is you know, at getting really nitty gritty and granular in evaluating tariff rates and schedules across every single utility. Is that, you know, a strategy that comes into play as sort of a secret sauce to achieving scale with, you know, solar and storage especially? Yeah, for us, I mean, it's, it's not only a monumental task to try to evaluate all of them, but even more of a task to try to keep up with them, right? Because they're constantly making the changes, right? And, and this is where it's interesting having the partner network as well. Because like when we're talking about emerging markets, um, it might not be a market where you want to run up and, and put an employee in there yet, right? Mm -hmm. You want to figure it out, but you necessarily don't want to spin your wheels doing it directly. What you do in the partner network is a lot of them are in those markets. And as long as you're offering you know, good services to support them, you know, creative you know, financing packages and stuff, helping them make it work, then it really helps you to get into those emerging markets. And really, the same thing with the rate tariffs and, and uh, you know, other ways. We've got to make it financially feasible for the host. Because that's really the most important thing at the end. There's a lot of talk about the backside and how we figure it out. Sure. But really, 
If it's not making sense to the host customer, there is no project. Which goes to the point of customer education. I think when you introduce storage to the equation, it's a much more complicated discussion. And there are definitely companies out there um, who are doing some neat modeling software solutions and others. But you're now adding a, a great deal of complexity to the equation, which will require the collective room to come up with a sales-facing customer solution of, to keep it simple, if you will. And I think that'll be one of the big challenges. Right. Yeah. Standard, so yeah, I mean, so among all the standard solar standard. actually uh, yeah. was one of the first company to build a microgrid storage in state of Maryland. Uh, it, it was a lot of demand charge offset through PJM. Uh, it wouldn't have gotten built if we didn't get a grant from Maryland um, Energy Administration. So the cost is still way out of whack where it's not financeable, but uh, we're lucky enough to get a grant, technology grant that we passed along to the host so that we could offset that cost and we got it built. Uh, still in a very infancy, I don't think it's ready for prime time. Uh, insulation was a pain. It was one of the hardest insulation that we ever did. Um, so there was a lot of learning curve, so we learned a lot, which is a good thing, but uh, it's definitely the way of the future um, is, you know, probably makes utilities a little bit upset because they will be, could be completely off grid. And so what, what was the pain, though, about installing that with <laughs> It's the uh, just the battery connection, all the frequency regulation. It was all off, and we had to go readjust. If it's slightly off, it goes offline. Then your solar system's off. Your client's unhappy. Uh, we did not build all this into our O&M uh, cost. So, uh, it was great that we did it. We got a lot of press for it, which is a good advertising type of thing and marketing, but for a pure profit margin business, that was not one of the best. As a CFO sitting there going, do we really do this? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but it was a good experience though. Okay. We'll do it better next time. Okay. So the, the bottom line is that it may make sense in a couple states, and even in those states, it may not still make sense. Yeah, I would also add probably Hawaii to that, because they require batteries anyway yeah. mm -hmm. for all solar projects. So. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thanks. In general, for your acquisition strategy of customers, would you say that schools and governments entities are more attractive than your standard for-profit entities or vice versa? For standard solar, absolutely. They have one of the best credit rating that will exist in 20 years. Um, for financier, they love universities and municipal government. It's, it's a slam dunk for financing that. You can bring me a project I could finance for you tomorrow, any side. So just bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Okay. All right, so I know we're sort of cutting up on time here, so I think that's all about um, what we have for this panel. But just want to give a quick round of applause to our panelists here.